welcome to Convergence Summit South. My next guest needs uh, little to no introduction. You all know who he is, but uh, tradition dictates we, we do introduce him. So uh, please welcome to the stage the former CEO, founder, and current executive chairman, Mr. Matthew Riley. This microphone, I'm sorry. <laughs> right, we're going to try this Piers Morgan style. Hopefully, uh, I'm Piers, obviously. Hopefully, slightly less annoying. I'm Madonna. <laughs> <laughs> right, Matthew, um, I really want to get to the get to your core. What what started this journey for you? So let's start right at the beginning. Uh, what was your first business idea, and you know how did you come up with it? Um, well, the first business idea, I guess it wasn't really a business. Uh, probably about I think I was about 10, um, and it, it, it was when it used to snow deep, especially up north, um, and I came up with this idea that I could clear people's uh, drives of snow, and I recruited my brother and some of his mates, um, and we went to the lady next door and said, can we clear your, your drive so you can get out and the postman can get in, and they're like, oh, that's lovely, thank you very much, and she gave us 20p and some sweets, so I give the guys the sweets, get the 20p, and sort of did it for a day. And that ended up with a couple of quid, which in those days was uh, was pretty good. Uh, so I guess that was my first business venture, uh, working out how to uh, make some money out of doing a, a quite a, I mean, your basic task. But uh, I guess I've always had it in, in me. And, and then went to school and sort of a typical, you know, I had my own tuck shop. I did, you know, you've heard it all before about entrepreneurs, what we, we tend to do. Um, and, and started from there, really, you know, buying something at one price and, and making a margin and selling it on. Simple as that, really. Okay, so how old were you when uh, Daisy came along? Where did the idea come from? How did that journey begin? Yeah, well, I'd, I'd sort of done three businesses before I founded Daisy. So I'd done recruitment, I'd done uh, a cable co cabling company, so Cat5, Cat6 Cabling, and I'd done consultancy, which was in telecoms. So it was more like call centre technologies, things like that, consultations. And I'd sold those three businesses. And what I'd found from starting a business was it was so difficult to get the telecom supply. Um, so at that stage, internet wasn't really, it was in its infancy. But just lines and calls was really difficult to get it installed into some new premises. And I'd read somewhere that BT Wholesale were going to start to offer uh, what was then WLR, uh, so Wholesale Line Rental. And I thought that sounds like a great solution. So rather than just having to do CPS, so uh, Carrier Pre-Select, for everyone that remembers that, um, you can actually tie up the lines and I thought that will be the thing that you can then contract a customer in for five years and get some longevity in, in, into your customer base. And I thought it looked like a great opportunity so, so we set the company up. Um, set up two people, I've always set up companies really small. Um, I've never thrown loads of money at them to start because I wanted to make sure they work. Um, so I literally just set up from my garage, went to knock some doors, spoke to some friends, got their telecoms, worked out how the hell to build this thing called Lines and Cults, work out how to provision it. Uh, and then went up from there, really, and, and built it sort of in a modular fashion. I think people think that we, we started big. We absolutely didn't. And if you descend our first premises, which were literally in a dungeon, uh, they, were, they were just not nice at all. But my view was customers were never going to come and see us. We went to see the customer, therefore keep the overheads down. So, you know, we're in a £3.50 a square foot office in Nelson for the first probably six years of our existence and then, then we moved up and paid five pounds fifty and then now I, I, I shudder sometimes looking at the bills that we pay for some of the London offices. We pay more for a little London office than we do for our head office up in Nelson which is frightening but uh, it's the way of the world. Yeah. So you're, you're 15 years on now, is there anything you wish you'd known at the beginning? Oh, lots of things, I mean you just, yeah, the big thing is you just make mistakes and the, all the way through. I, I've got so many things wrong from hiring people that are wrong from not motivating people in the right way because not everybody has the same drive and ambition that you've got and you can tire people out pretty quickly. As I'm sure Terry will tell you, I tire, tire him out regularly. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult when you're growing a business, especially if you're on your own. Um, I didn't have a business partner. Uh, my wife still doesn't even know what I do, really. She kind of has a rough idea, but no, doesn't really know. Um, so, so I think I find it quite a lonely place. I don't want you to... Sort of all sort of feeling sorry for me because I'm sure you won't. Uh, but it is a lonely place. You're running a business on your own. You've got a lot of business decisions. And I always took a real pride in employing people. And I, I always took it with a, um, 
a great passion to be able to give people work, to be able to create something, uh, certainly in the area that we set up the business, which was high in employment. Um, I took it really personally, um, and I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very, very big, lonely place when you're trying to run a business and make, make the right decisions. I think some of the things that I've learned are hiring great people. Um, everyone always says that to you. It's the hardest thing to do when you're flat out. When your business is growing really quickly, you cannot, I've done it so many times where I've rushed the decision, I've only given a person one interview, or I've not taken enough references, that's one of probably the biggest mistakes I made was with growing. You know, someone would walk in, I'd say, yep, you look as though you're a human being, you've got a job, sit there. Um, because we were, we were growing so quickly, I think that's one of the things that, that I've learned over time, is get, getting great people, just, just build great businesses for you. And I think you can see that today, you know, really proud of the stand that we've got for Daisy Wholesale and, and the guy that, that, that runs that and the team that they've built. Uh, I think it is all about surrounding yourself with, with great people that are actually better than you. you know, I'm a real believer in that. What's, what's the secret to finding great great people? Uh, it's so difficult, isn't it? Recruitment companies, if there's any in here, will tell you it's them. Uh, my view is it's a blend. A lot of the time I try and use my own network uh, from people I've met or people I've heard about. Um, you know, good salespeople that, you, that come and try and sell you something. I've recruited quite a few of those. So people who over the years have come in and sold us a photocopier before they know it, they're working for us. Um, I did the same with the bank, I did the same with the accountants. <laughs> it's quite a, a low cost way of recruiting people. Um, but also you, you, you kind of get the feel for somebody then, don't you? Because you see what they're going to be doing when they represent your company. So that's what I found. Sorry recruitment companies. <laughs> Right, okay, before we move on to your latest acquisition, do you want to tell us about your, your first? <laughs> God, yeah. Okay, so uh, we've done 49 acquisitions now, um, which just seems like a crazy amount of acquisitions to do, but um, sort of time has gone on. The first one was, um, as they always are, um, quite interesting. Uh, entrepreneur in Blackpool, uh, he took me out for a meal, which at that point I should have realised that there was something wrong. He spent 700 quid on a bottle of wine, I'd never spent more than about 20 quid on a bottle of wine at that stage. He turned up in a Rolls Royce Fountain. I turned up in, I think, I don't know, whatever I turned up in, but nothing like that. Um, he was just a real entrepreneur, so brilliant sales guy, absolutely full of shit. Uh, <laughs> yeah. If anyone knows anyone from Blackpool, he is Blackpool massive. He's that sort of type of guy. Uh, really, really um, great, you know, entertainment. Um, and, and we bought his business, and what he'd done is he, He'd got a great customer base, but he just put no infrastructure in behind it. So the customer service was, was pretty poor. The billing was all but non-existent. He wasn't checking his bills. He wasn't checking his carrier bills. So there so was great upside from, from our perspective, because we've always been quite good at working that back office. Um, and it was, just, it was just really interesting trying to do a deal with someone so entrepreneurial. Um, it was my first ever deal with regards to serious solicitors, serious accountants, and thankfully they were on my side. He chose to try and do it all himself, which worked to our favour. Uh, but I'd like to say he's still a friend now, you know, um, still have a beer with a guy every Christmas. It's a bit of a tradition that we have, um, you know, and, and he's gone off and I think he's done another four or five businesses and made even more money. Um, I call him Champagne Taste Lemonade Pockets because I always end up buying him a beer now. He's always skin, so he says. But he always turns up in a fancier car than me. <laughs> Alright, so we're on to number 49 now. Uh, Phoenix, tell us about that. How's the integration process going? Yeah, yeah. so uh, Phoenix IT Services uh, was a public company. We bought that. Um, it's one we've been looking at for probably about two and a half years. My view of the world is that as um, a community we need to get more and more in line with the IT re resellers and we need to understand a lot more about IT before they come and pitch our lunch. Um, so that's why we looked at Phoenix for two, two reasons really. One was the uh, accreditations, uh, so the Microsoft accreditations, their engineering and, and obviously their customer base. And also from a partner services perspective, um, so sort of my impression of Phoenix is it had lost its way. Nobody really knew what it was anymore, including the people that worked there, uh, including the people that ran it actually, uh, from the, the, the conversations that I had. Um, where, you know, whereas what I saw was a massive partner services business that can support any of the channel, any SI, to do any sort of installation or, or maintenance and support. Um, it's a hundred million pound business that in its own right, and it just got lost in their ether. It wasn't really on the website, it wasn't what they did, but I, I really felt strongly. 
because my, my background's always been partners. You know, we started Daisy with with business partners, and then we we built a, a reseller channel, the wholesale business that you see today. Um, I, I've not done direct sales up until about seven years ago um, in, in one of our businesses. So it, for me, I, it just stuck out like a sore thumb that they were missing a the trick there. The other side of it was business continuity. So one thing that I'm, I'm absolutely convinced of is that it's not getting any safer to live in this country. Um, and and it's, a, you know, it's a difficult thing if you're trying to run a business. How do you back up your business? How do you protect your business if something happens? Certainly if you're in a major city. Uh, and again, they've got this massive asset of business continuity with offices throughout the country that again, nobody really knew of. It wasn't really what they were trying to do. They just kept talking about cloud. I'm not quite sure they knew what cloud was. Um, and we, we, and we saw, so I saw a couple of assets that I think um, more than pay for themselves in their own right, let alone everything else that, that we got with it. And what we found from speaking to the people within the business is they just wanted a little bit of leadership. You know, I think they'd have five CEOs in about a similar amount of years, loads of change. And I think they just wanted some continuity. Uh, and a plan, and, and I think we've got that plan and we're starting to, to address that and start to market that out, out to the, the channel. But you know, if, if you've got customers that need multi-sat operations or engineering in, in Glasgow and you're based on the south coast, please come and talk to us because I think there's something that we can really do on scale. You know, we've got just short 1,300 engineers now throughout the country. It makes us the biggest partner services business in the UK. Uh, so that's one of the things that people don't understand about Phoenix. Yeah, sure. Okay, I mean, what kind of challenges did you come up against with, with the acquisition? Do you have any advice for perhaps some people in the audience going through, you know, similar things? Yeah, I mean, every acquisition is different, no matter what anyone tells you, because you're dealing with individuals, so of course it's going to be different because they're individual. Uh, I think you do see similar traits that go through, so the entrepreneurs uh, that you try and buy from, they're always the tricky ones. They're going to be, because they've, they've built the business. Um, they, they've run things up probably on shoestrings a lot of the time because you know they want to try and make as much money as they can out of that, that, that business. I think the corporate ones tend, to, from my experience, have had more fat on them. So they've tended to have too many layers, um, you know, 15 layers from the top to, to someone who's an engineer or someone who's selling, you know, just crazy layers of management. Um, so you get different acquisitions, you get different reasons for, for doing the acquisition, you know, whether you're buying skill set or whether you're buying customer base or whether you're just buying scale. You know, some of the deals we've done, we've just done it purely to, to buy scale, to, to start to dominate a particular area of the market. Sure. So. You mentioned uh, dealing with entrepreneurs there. I mean, <coughs> obviously yourself, you must have had a tremendous amount of tenacity and self-belief to get to where you are now. I mean, what other sort of traits do you feel make a good uh, channel entrepreneur, I guess? Um, you know, what, what do you think? Well, I think this channel's brilliant at creating entrepreneurs. Themselves actually, but we, I mean, as a channel, it's, so, it's always reinventing itself. I was just saying, you know, there's a lot of names when I came into the show today that I've not seen before, and that's what's great about this channel. It's exciting, it's moving, it's fast moving. And I think the people that work in it are colourful, uh, they like to make money, they like to enjoy themselves. Um, you know, I've got a lot of great friends in the channel, um, and, and, and I, I see the tenacity that they've got, but also the, the, the opportunity, right? You know, let's not forget, BT still have over 50% of the SMB market. We have not touched it. We are all doing not well enough. You know, we've I've got about four or five percent, not enough. You know, there's no second challenger that's that's hitting BT. There that, that, that should be. You know, our, we don't compete. I guess I guess we do with each other, but not really. What we should be doing is competing with the, with the incumbent. You know, and what I found is eighty percent of the business we win comes from BT, um, and we spend so much time trying to win business from competitors. <laughs> And actually, that's the stuff that we don't make as much money on. It's harder to prize away. The customer, as a, you know, isn't as, as keen to move. So, so my view is, you know, let's bring on BT and uh, try and compete with them. You know, they're big enough to, to be able to take that. But the marketing that I see is they've still got about 52% of the market. So let's go and get some. Okay, so uh, Daisy Groups, picking up some size now, I guess. Uh, uh, I mean, what, what are the biggest challenges have you come across for you personally and, and, in, and, and in the business? Yeah, yeah, I mean, as a business now, we're over 700 million turnover. Uh, we'll, we'll next year do over 100 million EBITDA, 80 million free cash. So a very profitable business, which is great. But we've, like I said, we've not even started. Um, I'd always said I wanted to build a billion pound business. I'm already saying that's got to be two billion. Um, and I, I can see it there. It's absolutely there over the next five years. And that's not just acquisition, that's organic growth. Uh, I think there's a real opportunity to be able to cross-sell back into our customer base. Uh, 
the products or services that we've got. From a, from a difficulty perspective of growing a business, I think you go through loads of different changes as you're growing. So from 20 people to 60, that's a, a step change because you've got to bring managers in. Uh, from 60 to 160, a different change because you've got to bring serious directors in to help you take, take you on that journey. I think probably the hardest thing I've ever felt um, with, with Daisy was when we got over 200 people. Because I'm quite a personal person, I like to have a cup of tea with people, I like to chat. And when we were below 200 people, I pretty much knew everybody. I'd kind of know at least half of the, their partners or the mums and dads, um, you know, because we did lots of social events. I found that really difficult going from 200 to 400, 600 people. I found it really alien. It took, probably took me about two years to get used to it. Uh, the fact that you walk into an office and people that kind of know you were, I didn't know anybody. Um, but, you know, you walk around and you, you, get, you get to chat to people and, and you move on. I think one of the other challenges that you get personally as an entrepreneur is, you know, people say to you, when's enough? Um, and everybody's got different levels. I just know that at the moment, mine ain't enough. You know, I'm greedy. <laughs> <laughs> I just think there's a great opportunity for us all. You know, if, if someone said to me, and I have this a lot to speak quite a bit in schools, you know, what, what, what business would you set up tomorrow? I'd set up in the, this industry because I think there's just so much opportunity to make vast amounts of money. And that's kind of why I did it. So. So if it sure that's why you're on it. <laughs> Try to do the same. If it all went belly up tomorrow, then you're uh, straight back in. Straight back in. Yeah. Do you think you could create another Daisy in the, in the current market, or what would you do differently? Or um, it's difficult, isn't it? I'd, I'd absolutely um, think you can build a business the size and scale that we've got to. No doubt about that. I'm sure there's businesses already in here that, that are doing that, and, and, and you know, will may even be bigger than us and more successful. And good luck to you. Um, I, I think. I do it slightly differently now because I think the market's changed. You know, would I set up just doing lines and calls as we did at the start? No, I'd be suicide to do that. Uh, would I set up with the cloud with some computing? Yes, I would. I think from from my perspective, I've always liked businesses where you can have a recurring revenue stream. So I always liked a business that you get up in the morning and actually the wages are paid. You don't have to sell a load of tin to be able to pay the wages. I, I've always had it the role reversal, that I want to be able to pay the wages, turn the lights on, and then anything that you sell over and above that in the month goes on and you move forward. It's just a business idea that I, I've got in, in, in me that I like those type of businesses. I always look for recurring revenue. I look for cash-rich businesses, so I like actually being paid before I've got to pay a supplier. <coughs> that, that just makes good business sense, right? Especially if you want to grow quickly. Most of the businesses I see go both run out of cash. We bought quite a few of them, and it, it, was, it was through nothing other than neglect of cash. Sure. So you, you set this uh, two, two billion target in your mind. Yeah. How, how long is it going to take you to get there? I think less than five years. Yeah, so I, I really do. <laughs> no, no, I just, I, I, you know, if you look at our mobile growth, the, the penetration that we've got, if you just look at our direct business, only 20% of our customers take mobile, but they've all got mobile. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a good compelling uh, proposition, so. I'm sure if we have the right conversations, we can get that up to 50%, 60%. Same with Ethernet sales. You just go on and on and on. Yeah. Okay. How, how would you describe the current uh, state of the channel? Um, you know, why do you like being a part of the channel? What, what is it about the channel? I think because it's always reinventing itself. I think because it's exciting. I think you get very dynamic people. Um, someone can set up literally from the garage. And I like that. You know, I like the fact that it doesn't cost lots and lots of money um, to come into. In fact, a lot of the businesses that I've seen that started off with a large sum of money haven't been as successful as the, as the people who, who built it up, you know, from day one. Do you think people get carried away with maybe shiny offices and... I, I, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's one of the things we always look for in acquisition. If you walk into the, 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 the offices and they've got, you know, big massive fish tanks and fancy fountains and, you know, the receptionist's on 40 grand, you know, straight away I'm thinking, God, cost savings. Yeah. I've walked into offices where the you know receptionist driving a Porsche. Now that might not be the business reason why she was driving a Porsche, or it might have been a business reason. I'm not sure. But to be fair, you look at it, she was very very attractive. But unfortunately, she didn't work for us anymore. For me. Um, but you know, you just you've got to do it for what, what the reasons you want. I think the great thing about this business and this channel is you can have a great lifestyle business. You know, you can have a brilliant lifestyle business. And it's exciting. And, you know, I think we all forget that customers really don't get what we do. They really don't get technology. They really don't get communications. They get what they do. So whether it's an engineering business or whether it's a clothing business or whether it's a baker's, they're experts in their own field. And our job is to try and make it 
not complicated for them and offer them a solution that, that actually helps their business grow. And if you think about digital Britain, where we want to go with that, where the government want to go with it, where the world's going with it, where everything's connected, we should just be so bloody excited right now because we want part of that. And you, you can't do that without the plumbing. You know, and I've said this to many government ministers, you know, unless you get the plumbing right, unless you get the connectivity right, you're just never going to get to this digital path that you think you're going to go down. I'm with you, it's going to happen, but you've got to get the plumbing right. And I think that's where we all fit in. Uh, because most customers need people like us to be able to explain things to them. And to be able to explain you know, the benefits of, well, if you've got this, this is what it means to your business. And I don't think you can do that just solely on the web or solely from a call centre in India. It ain't going to work. You, know, you need to sit and understand the customer's needs. And, 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 and what i found is they're the, the most loyal customers you'll ever have. If you've done that sale where they've actually got something that's helped their business grow. Someone comes in two p cheaper, so what? You're just not going to lose that customer. Sure. Okay. You talked. You talked about the the Phoenix acquisition. I mean, what else are you going to be betting on in the next twelve months, or would you bet on in the next twelve months? Um, I think the big thing for us is security. Um, I think off the back of the business continuity business that we've now got, um, where people can take uh, a dedicated seat or they can have a partial seat, you know, for if something happens with their business. I think it's like insurance. So you just sell it as insurance and we're, we're pushing that through all our sales teams and all our channels now. I think what we're seeing is people are starting to say, well, I've been hit by some cyber crime. Um, is there any insurance you can give me for that? I think that's going to be huge over the next two or three years. You know, the, the amount of times people are getting hacked is obscene. Uh, we've had it done to us ourselves at Daisy. Uh, I didn't think it could happen, but it can. <laughs> Trust me. And it's not great. You know, they hold you to answer. And they're smart. It costs us $500 to get some of our data back that they bought us out of. So guess what? You pay $500 in Bitcoin because it's just easy. It was a no-brainer for me. They looked, I had all the, all the CTOs and everyone all huddled in going, oh my God, I've got this big thing. I'm just saying, pay the flipping money. Just get it back. You know, you've just got to get that data back. And it was, it was pretty simple data anyway. It was only desktop stuff. But you know, this is what's happening. You know, we employ a lot of people to make sure this doesn't happen. And it still happens. You know? And I think there's a big opportunity in that space for us as a channel Again, to make it simple for SMB, you know, if you've got, you know, a closed shop, they just don't understand that someone could come and hack their website, get into all their information, get their customer list. You know, we've seen it with the big dating scandal recently. Thankfully, my name wasn't on it. <laughs> Although there were a few at Desi that were, allegedly, allegedly. Um, no, you, you see it with that, don't you? I mean, that's real life. And I, I get mates down the pub who have a chat and go, well, so would, would you be able to help us if we were in that situation? And I think it's important that we start thinking about how we can put that into the channel. Yeah. Is there anything else you'd uh, be betting on other than security? Or? Um, I, I think it just goes back to the basics. I think, you know, I, I've always tried to be not at the bleeding edge. So let a few people launch it, see if it works, and then we'll come along. So things like our Wi-Fi product that we, we've launched today, I think that's really, really big. I think Wi-Fi, I mean, anyone that's got kids, if you go to a hotel, and they just want to, they just want to kill you, don't they, if the Wi-Fi is crap. I mean, no matter, this is the first thing they do, oh, what's a Wi-Fi password? Like, little buggers, look at this bloody brilliant hotel you're in. Um, yeah, they can't tell that out of Burnley, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, backhander. Uh, but you see it, you know, in life, don't you? You sit in a coffee shop and if a Wi-Fi is shit, you're just like, it drives you mad. I think Wi-Fi is just huge, and I think rather than it being a, a free giveaway, I think it still will be free, but you might just have to give some data, because I think companies are getting more intelligent on the way that they capture the data that the people sat in the coffee shop and working out what they can do with that information. Got a real example, we, we do Celtic Football Club. Um, so Celtic Football Club, you go in any one time, we can have about 25,000 people on the Wi-Fi at one, one time. I think it goes from no to about 25,000 in about a seven minute period because everyone's coming up. Um, and the amount of information that we get from those handsets is incredible. So for instance, on European uh, uh, Champions League night, the amount of iPhone uses Go, goes up by about 25% as opposed to a normal match day, so all your corporates are coming in. Things like that and the marketing information that you can get from it. You can see how many people are on what level of Apple software and how many people have upgraded who haven't. You can just start to get really good feels for what people are doing and where they move in the stadium. And I think from a marketing perspective, again going back to digital, masses and masses of opportunity. If you're a marketeer, what a great opportunity to be able to work out what your customers are doing and what they're not doing, what they like, what they don't like. Um, and, and harmlessly, you, know, you can do it without without the, the consumer being uh, interfered in, in any way. 
Okay, I'm starting to run out of time here, but um, finally I'd like to ask, uh, you've, you've handed over the reins yep. this year to Neil Muller. Yep. I don't know if Neil's in the room or not. Um, no, he's working. Oh, he's got... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, what does the future of Daisy look like under uh, his leadership? Yeah, I mean, from, from my perspective, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. And there's a time, again, it goes back to stages, where you've got to bring professional management that can take you to that next level. I've never, ever managed 4,500 people before. Neil's done it for countless years. And I think I got to the stage where I want to do the things that I enjoy doing. So I like doing deals. I like looking at new, new, new opportunities. I like looking and working out where the vision of the business should go. What I don't perhaps like doing is, um, you know, HR, um, annual appraisals, things like that. They're all very important, but uh, I'm not really the man for that type of thing. Uh, and, and we've brought a team in that can, I think, can take us to that next level and that next level of growth, um, and, and, and allow me to do the things that I think I'm, I'm probably best suited to do. Sure. Okay. Do we have any uh, questions from the floor at this point? Down here, there's a microphone coming away. If you'd like to just introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Paul from Telecoms Cloud. Just wondering where you see the industry changing with new markets like the Internet of Things and API providers and where that's going. Yeah, I think it's a massive opportunity for us, as I said before. I think what we've got to do is try and embrace it and work out how you make money out of it, as ever. Um, and just see where you fit in that, in that, that, that sort of... Uh, vanilla slice as it were and whether you can make a margin out of it and then how do you provide that back to the customer I think the internet of things is here it's already happened you know I worked out the other day I've got 16 iPads in my house I mean, just it's mental the amount of Apple devices I've got it's ridiculous because it runs all the house you know it's our system that runs everything so it's open the curtains which is the laziest thing ever but it's plenty direct um, to, to you know your data to your internet to your Apple TV to your heating, to your lighting, just everything's on there. And, and I think what we've got to do is try and work out how you make money out of that. Um, but I think it's a huge opportunity, and I'm sure there's plenty of people in this room already thinking about how they're going to do it and already doing it. But I think it's huge. I think we're best best placed to, to make money out of it as well, because I think we get it. And we have the relationship with the customer. And for me, it's always about having a relationship with the customer. If you've got, if they trust you, you can pretty much sell them whatever you need to sell them. Any other questions? Got one at the back there. Thank you. Matthew Lambert, SI Capital. Um, 49 acquisitions, yep. what's your best and your worst? Good question. Um, I could sit on the fence, but I won't. Uh, worst one, AT comms. Um, just from a, a picking it up and thinking, oh my God, what is this business? Um, from the revenues, from just the way that it had all unfolded, unfortunately, for that business. I think they've got some good people in there, but it just got itself really confused. Uh, and the problem is buying it out of admin, it's, it's never good. So I think it was okay in terms of the return that we paid for it, because we didn't pay a lot of money, but in headaches, by far and away the biggest headache one we ever did, um, being honest. Uh, the best one, difficult to say really, good, different businesses for different reasons. I'd probably say the first, because it sort of set us off on the right way and it was probably the best return that, that, that we had because it was early days of doing the deal. Uh, it's quite a smart deal, I'm about to say that. But we did, a, did a quite a cl clever deal because we didn't borrow any money. So we gave them a little bit of money up front and then we paid for, for, for the rest of it out of the profits of the company. So it was quite, quite good from my perspective because I didn't have to give away any equity and I didn't have to borrow any money. So I'll probably say that one was the first one, although it was quite a small deal. Any others? Quick one, anyone? Right, okay. Well, that was easy. Yeah. <laughs> right, you want to put your hands together and say thank you to Matthew Riley.